I did my PhD in astrophysics on conditions in the center of the sun, which you would think would be totally removed from all earthly considerations. After I finished my PhD, I was told by a colleague at the University of California, Berkeley, that his colleagues in the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory were using my solar calculations to improve hydrogen bombs. And as you can imagine, this was quite a shock. I became involved in the social responsibility and science movement, and I broadened out. And so I became more of an interdisciplinary researcher. I became very interested in economics and wrestled with so-called theory in neoclassical economics. And now I've reached a stage where really my colleagues and I find that neoclassical economics is not a science at all. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to jump in here to say Happy New Year and also to announce for our UK listeners that MMT founder Professor Bill Mitchell will be giving a talk in London on Friday, the 26th of January 2024 from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Unite building near Holborn Tube. The Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies are hosting the event. I hope you can make it and I look forward to seeing you there. I've linked to where you can get free tickets for the event in the show notes for this episode, where, as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially by going to patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far, and thanks, as ever, for the time you put into understanding MMT. For the first time in 2024, let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. Unfortunately, Patricia's away for this episode, but I am delighted to be joined today by author, physicist, and professor in the Environment and Society Group at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Mark Diesendorf, thanks so much for making the time to join me today, Mark. Well, hello, Christian, and thank you for doing this podcast. We were talking offline before that uh, your grounding is in physics, but your research now is interdisciplinary. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Well, yes, actually. I did my PhD in astrophysics wow. <laughs> on conditions in the center of the sun, which you would think would be totally removed from all earthly considerations. But after I finished my PhD, I was told by a colleague at the University of California, Berkeley, that his colleagues in the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory were using my solar calculations to improve hydrogen bombs, to improve their design of hydrogen bombs, because Livermore is in fact a hydrogen bomb factory. And as you can imagine, this was quite a shock. And it's influenced my future research. I became involved in the social responsibility and science movement, and I broadened out. And I started working on renewable energy and working on energy. I soon found that science and technology are not sufficient. I also have to consider economics, sociology, political science, you name it. And so I became more of an interdisciplinary researcher. And at the same time, I became very interested in economics and wrestled with the standard so-called theory in neoclassical economics and couldn't really make sense out of it. And now I've reached a stage where Really, my colleagues and I find that neoclassical economics is not a science at all, at least when applied to macro systems, whole nations and whole planets. And it has no real scientific basis. And that then led me into interest in ecological economics and MMT. 
Great stuff. And you bring all of that together in your new book or latest book with Rod Taylor, uh, which is called The Path to an Ecologically Just Civilization, which sounds like a great idea. And I think a great way into the book is to just introduce us to the hikers that you introduce the readers to in chapter three. Tell us about that metaphor. Okay. Well, I use the metaphor to introduce the concepts of sustainability and the process of sustainable development. So we have a group of hikers asking the advice of a farmer who's at the roadside mending his fence, and they say they want to climb that distant mountain there, which I would call Mount Sustainability, and he makes the usual response, well, actually, if I wanted to climb that mountain, I wouldn't start from here, (laughs) and I wouldn't go on a hot day like today. And I guess we're trying to bring out the point that Sustainability is our distant goal, what we're aiming for, and it includes ecological sustainability, it includes social justice, a more socially equal society, and it includes a more peaceful society. And they're really our main concerns because we see the greatest threats to human civilization as climate change and a number of other environmental impacts on biological diversity and fresh water and soils and forests and so on, but also the increasing inequality between the rich and the poor and the increasing risk of nuclear war. Because right now, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist has advanced the hands of the doomsday clock to 90 seconds to midnight. And they've done that on the basis of both the risk of nuclear war and climate change. And while a lot of people listening will be saying, yeah, you're talking a lot of sense. We want to go to this destination that's in the distance. We want to climb that mountain. But in the book, obviously, you emphasize how the institutions that we've built are at odds with how we feel as humans. And you liken the earth to the Titanic, which in the introduction, which I think is an apt way to sort of explain this difference between what people want as humans and where we're actually headed. Tell us about that metaphor. Well, yes, it's a metaphor for spaceship Earth. So the Titanic, as listeners know, was undergoing its maiden voyage in 2012. It was regarded as unsinkable, quite a complex system, but thoroughly tested, plenty of backup and so on. But the reality was that The captain was under pressure from the wealthy industrialist owners of the ship to race at top speed through icy waters to complete the maiden journey. And this was despite the warnings of a number of people that sea ice was a danger and that really caution was required. And of course, as we know, it struck an iceberg It sunk in nearly four kilometres of water in the North Atlantic. 1,500 people perished. But even here, the statistics of the deaths are quite interesting because the third-class people, of course, inhabited the bowels of the ship and three-quarters of the third-class people perished. Half of the second-class perished and only one-third of the first-class passengers who were up on the top actually perished. The metaphor there, of course, conveys to the situation of spaceship Earth, where the poorer members of the community, the less powerful, the less wealthy, are greatly disadvantaged by the whole system, while the wealthy, whether it's the 1% or the wealthiest 10% on the planet or 20%, they actually come out of it much better than the others. And not only that, of course, And going beyond the metaphor now, it is the rich individuals and rich countries which have by far the biggest environmental impacts on the planet and on the life support system. And for that reason, we argue that it is absolutely essential if as part of protecting our life support system, the environment, we also have to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor, and in particular, reduce the ability of the rich through their spending and investments to destroy the planet, essentially, 
So social justice and environmental impact are tied together very closely. And also we can argue that the threat of war is highly relevant because when wars occur, the environmental impacts are enormous as well as the impacts on millions of innocent people, of course, as well. So we argue that they all link together. Yeah, obviously war, great for GDP, which doesn't distinguish between building things and blowing things up, really. Exactly. And certainly one of the policies that we recommend is really to abandon GDP as any kind of measure of well-being. And rather, we need a whole set of indicators which span uh, public health, public education, housing, transportation, quality of jobs. We really need a range of indicators if we want to talk about human well-being. And GDP has its uses, but it is very limited in its uses. And of course, we all know that GDP tells us nothing about the gap between the rich and the poor. We know that it counts destructive events. And I think you've made that point very clearly, as well as constructive good events. So GDP really must be discarded as part of a program of reforming the economic system. Okay, so to bring this all together, and apologies, I'm going to torture all of your metaphors right now. Oh, no. We're hikers. We want to get to that destination, a sustainable future. And as we explore our environment, trying to find the path, we find that we're actually on a ship heading for an iceberg. So we go up to the bridge to find out what's going on. And as you've said, we find the captain steering the ship into the iceberg because whispering in the captain's ear is a neoclassical economist. Yes, which is indeed the case with our governments. Almost all governments on this planet have been deeply captured by an economic system that is designed, actually by design, is basically it exploits our life support system, the biosphere, and it exploits the vast majority of people on the planet as well. So you have a whole chapter on breaking the bonds of state capture, which I want to come on to. But first, the reason that me and Patricia got into doing this podcast is because we see what you see, that there's this school of thought, it's almost a religion, that is legitimizing and uh, justifying heading for the iceberg and going faster. And in your chapter seven, which is transforming the economic system is the title of that chapter, you write about some of the shortcomings of the economic orthodoxy. Tell us about that chapter, you know, how eventually in all your studies, eventually it comes down to economics. What happens comes down to the ideas of some defunct economist, as I think Keynes once said. Well, there are three really big issues that concern us about the existing economic system. And one of them is the notion that it promotes that endless growth in consumption on a finite planet is feasible and is actually desirable. So that's the first one. And in fact, through my research in energy, I found data that actually confirm the very large literature now pointing out the impossibility of endless growth in consumption. But if you look at the energy system, then in 2009, fossil fuels provided 80% of all global energy use. I'm talking about the so-called total final energy consumption of the whole planet. 80% was fossil fuels. In the decade after 2009, we've had massive growth in renewable energy. It has been incredibly successful. And yet, in 2019, after 10 years, fossil fuels still supply 80% of total global energy consumption. How is that possible, you might ask? Well, it's possible and it has occurred because consumption has been growing at the same time. And it's a bit like an athlete completing an 800 metres race, coming towards the finishing straight, and then, to her horror, she sees the officials running away with the finishing tape. Now, she's a pretty good athlete and she's going to overtake the officials eventually, but she's not going to break any records. And that's really the problem with 
energy and climate change. Eventually, renewable energy will replace all fossil fuels. But by that time, very likely, the climate will have crossed one or more tipping points and we will be in a situation that is irreversible. So consumption is the first big issue that concerns us. And there are many issues with the conventional economic system. Another point of concern is the notion that wealth trickles down from the rich to the poor. And now there have been a number of studies that refute that quite clearly. Last year, in 2022, there was a study of all the OECD countries spanning a period of 50 years. And what the study was looking at was those countries that basically gave big tax deductions for the rich. And they found that what the result was that inequality, of course, increased, but there was no benefit according to standard economic indicators like GDP or even employment. So that's been thoroughly scotched, and yet it dominates a lot of government actions. Certainly in my country, Australia, we are in a situation where both major political parties have agreed to massive tax deductions for the rich. Another issue that affects, again, the ability to move to climate mount sustainability is that let's not let our major political decisions be made by the market. The market, it is claimed, can make essentially all the really big decisions we have to make at the level of government. The problem with that is, of course, that the markets are basically dominated by the 1%, the very rich and powerful, the large corporations. And yet, even within neoclassical economics, back in 1956, a study of what's called the second best, a study of the real market, not the ideal market, has found that, in fact, government intervention in the market can, in many cases, be a good thing. It does not necessarily reduce economic efficiency. It may or it may not. Now, if you put those three issues together, endless growth in consumption, trickle down in wealth, and let the markets decide, you get a collapsing society, a society that is environmentally destructive and socially very unequal and is heading for slow collapse. And so we really need a different economic system I think there's a lot to learn from ecological economics, which is not a branch of neoclassical economics, but is a transdisciplinary field, which is progressed by some enlightened economists, by scientists, by lawyers, by political scientists, and others. And within that broader framework that does not rely on unrealistic mathematical models, it puts environmental protection and social justice ahead of economic efficiency. And that's what we need if we want our civilization, our industrial society to survive. Speaking of classical economics, I think obviously Steve Keen has been doing great work and is pretty much chapter and verse on the shortcomings of neoclassical economics in respect to climate change. And you quote him and cite him in chapter seven, One great quote from him, which you lead the chapter with, virtually every aspect of conventional economic theory is intellectually unsound. Virtually every economic policy recommendation is just as likely to do general harm as it is to lead to the general good. Far from holding the intellectual high ground, economics, by which he means neoclassical economics, because that's the only game in town, rests on a foundation of quicksand. So that's Steve Keen, and he did a paper in 2021, and the title of it pretty much is all you need to know. (laughs) The title is The Appallingly Bad Neoclassical Economics of Climate Change. And I can see in your chapter you're in accordance with Professor Keane's analysis. Did you have time to dig deeper into William Nordhaus's work? Because he got the Nobel Prize for that, or sorry, the Swedish Central Bank Prize (laughs) for, for this work, which was quite sanguine about climate change. He was basically trying to calculate not what climate change might do to life on Earth, but rather what climate change mitigation 
might do to GDP, which is, that's the state of mainstream economics. But I wondered what your thoughts were on that. Well, I would strongly agree with Steve Keen that much of what Nordhaus has written about the economics of climate change is simply nonsense. Steve Keen has pointed out the absurd assumption that Nordhaus makes that the impacts of climate change are likely to be small because nowadays most people work indoors. And therefore, he claims they won't be affected by rising sea levels, by floods, by droughts, by firestorms. All these things we've been seeing around the world in recent years, which are really accelerating in frequency and severity. And really, you read that in the abstract of his paper and you think, no, they can't mean that. And then you go into it and it's like, well, yeah, that's actually what they mean. But the real worry is that Nordhaus still has some influence. And he has the phony Nobel Prize, the ones that economists have created to give to themselves, and he still has influence. He has even influence within the intergovernmental panel on climate change, not on the climate science, but on the climate mitigation. But of course, Nordhaus is making assumptions which are totally contradicted by climate scientists. Nordhaus is talking with equanimity about global heatings of perhaps six degrees Celsius and saying, look, it's okay. He's no climate scientist and climate science is really concerned now that there is really no hope of keeping global heating below one and a half degrees. And it'll be an enormous struggle to bring it down to two degrees and we're actually heading for three degrees, if not more. So, yes, and Steve Keen has done great work. But I would say that he has the quotation from Steve that you quoted a short time ago. Steve has understated. He's saying that neoclassical economics could be equally bad as good. Well, I think his own work shows, and, and certainly our understanding of neoclassical economics, is that it is doing far more harm than good, particularly at the macro level, at the level of whole nations and beyond. And so on the macro side of things, obviously me and Patricia, our listeners, most of them I imagine think, well, modern money theory can help immensely with this necessary urgent transformation needed to get us on that path to a sustainable civilization. In your research into economics, tell us about how you first encountered MMT. Well, I actually encountered it through the work of Bill Mitchell. And so I actually had a fairly tough introduction because somebody recommended his textbook that he wrote jointly with Ray and... One other person? Watts. Watts, yeah. that's correct. Martin Watts. And it's quite a challenging read, but as I read it, a lot of the problems that I've had with trying to understand conventional neoclassical economics, these problems fell away because the presentation of Bill Mitchell and colleagues is really very clear and very rigorous, and it completely transforms the way of looking at of economic systems, especially macroeconomic systems. And I be for the first time, I felt I'm beginning to understand economics, but not conventional economics, which is really incomprehensible because it's nonsense, mostly nonsense at the macro level. So that was really the first. And then I'm still working through some of the chapters, so I can't claim to have a full understanding of the banking system I've got the basics, I think, but it is quite complicated, and I think it's deliberately so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the rate-setting committees at the various central banks around the world can't claim to fully understand <laughs> the banking system as well. I mean, there is dispute about whether raising interest rates adds to aggregate demand or not, depending on how much debt there is out there in the non-government sector and things like that. And I think slowly... The business press is starting to come around to the idea that, for instance, government so-called debt is just another liability of the government, just like cash and central bank reserves are. And sorry, we're probably getting into the weeds a little bit here, but it's still all up for grabs, basically. 
Yes, I think a, a good thing that's come out of the the current situation with inflation around much of the world is that there is a real debate going on now, certainly in Australia, and I believe in other parts of the world, about whether it makes sense for central banks to keep raising interest rates under the current inflation problems, which are largely due to issues outside of the control of individual countries. So the war in the Ukraine, for example, is obviously playing a role, but also the impact on much of the economy during the peak of the COVID pandemic. I mean, business is still recovering from that. Many businesses went bust. A lot of supply chains collapsed, and they all have to be rebuilt. And so it's understandable that there is shortage of materials and prices have gone up. And what we've also found in Australia, I'm not sure if it's the case in other countries, but some very large businesses, especially retail businesses, have basically been just pushing up prices in order to push up their profits. And there have been studies done here that suggest that is quite an important factor in the inflation that is taking place, that these companies have seized the opportunity and are pushing up prices far beyond the inflationary pressures that exist coming in from overseas. Yes, Isabella Weber and other co-authors have done a lot of scholarly work about that, and she calls it seller's inflation. And it got called in the popular press greedflation, which it's emotive language. I quite liked the two Bloomberg presenters who coined the phrase excuseflation, where the reason that these firms didn't raise prices in non-inflationary times was they weren't confident that the rest of their competitors were going to raise prices at the same time because they could start a bidding war, basically, or a price war, rather, if they were the only ones to raise prices. But once they're confident that there's almost an implicit agreement that they're all going to do it together in step, then they can go for it, basically. That sounds very plausible to me. Could I come back to a little bit more about MMT? Yeah, sure. Because I've been trying to spread the word about the potential for MMT to help with dealing with climate mitigation, for example. And I've talked to some economists who, within the sort of broader neoclassical framework, are critics of the more narrow neoliberal views, but they have difficulty in speaking publicly about modern monetary theory because they say that some proponents of modern monetary theory are presenting it inaccurately, that some of the more popular presentations they say are claiming that you can just create money willy-nilly It's like a magic pudding that never gets eaten. And of course, we know that it's not quite so simple, that money creation has to remain within the capacity of the economy. We have to have the labor force, the technologies, the infrastructure, the raw materials, and so on, if we are to avoid inflation when we start creating large quantities of money. At least that's my current understanding Yeah. I mean, I would say to those critics, please show me where these proponents of MMT haven't acknowledged that there's an inflation constraint to money creation, because I think even the people with a basic understanding of it, that's pretty much the second thing you learn after the core idea that under a floating exchange rate currency regime, governments have no choice but to spend money by spending it into existence. If the government is a currency issuer, government spending is money creation, taxation by the government is money deletion. And a lot of people get stuck on trying to argue the case that's true. But then the next thing that you logically ask is, okay, well, what are the limits? And you've just outlined the limits there, Mark, that if something's not for sale in the currency that the government creates, or it's in short supply spending more money or creating more spending power in the economy to buy those limited things will push up the price level. 
But I think like most people learn that, most MOT proponents learn that. And the <laughs> the detractors who go, oh, you, MMT people think there's a magic money tree that's going to solve all the problems, when you push them on it and say, okay, well, who said that? And it's usually a tweet they'll link to. <laughs> it's certainly not in any of the scholarly work or any of the popular press stuff like the deficit myth. And even the sort of semi-serious, semi-formal stuff that gets written by bloggers, I would say, also acknowledges it, but it was still tarred with this brush. Yes, that's my impression too. And I would make the additional point to these critics that by appropriate spending, one can actually increase the capacity of the economy. If you're spending on the appropriate infrastructure, for example, on job creation in the creation of appropriate green industries, you can, in fact, increase the economic capacity of a country through your spending and therefore reduce the risk of inflation as a result of that spending. But in Australia, we saw during the pandemic, our federal government created and spent hundreds of billions of dollars just to keep the economy afloat, and that did not lead to inflation. And that's a pretty strong argument. The inflation came later, more recently, with the Ukraine war and the profiteering and, and so on. And of course, in the United States, they created far more than just a few hundred billion dollars. And as you mentioned earlier, Professor L. Randall Ray, if you ask him about the post-pandemic inflation, I'm going to paraphrase some stuff that he said to me in interviews, but basically a lot of people will say, oh, MMT is helicopter money. Helicopter money is what happened during the pandemic. And so we had MMT during the pandemic and now we've got inflation. And his counter to that is actually, well, nobody asked any MMT economist what to do. None of that policy was MMT informed. And as it was, he was not a proponent of the just handing out stimulus checks. He was saying, well, MMT is targeted spending. As MMTs, we're advocates of the job guarantee, where we're adding demand precisely where it's needed in the economy for workers who, for whom, unfortunately, there is a zero bid. And MMT is saying, well, I think we can do better than that. I think we can actually have a socially inclusive wage <laughs> instead of having this pool of unemployed people expanding and contracting just to hit an inflation target which is monetary policy. Uh, and I know that you've put in the book that you're advocating for a job guarantee because obviously a just transition is going to bring about some disruption and people need to know if they're going to get behind a just transition that it's going to be done in a just way to be tautological about it and that there should be a social flaw put underneath the quality of life while we're undergoing this transition. I wondered if you were okay to talk about the job guarantee for a minute. Well, yes. I mean, I think the job guarantee has advantages over the other alternative of universal basic income, which is really that a job guarantee focuses on people who are unemployed and want to work, and it pays them a decent wage. And as a result, it's going to be less expensive than a universal basic income. A universal basic income is... <laughs> if spread over the whole population, including the rich, is going to have to be quite small. So I see first a job guarantee is more targeted. It offers socially productive work that normally is not done in the market economy. So for example, remediation of the environment, which is absolutely vital work, but many more things. And then as Bill Mitchell has pointed out, it can act as a buffer for the economic cycle. It can smooth the bumps, the booms and busts, the booms and recessions. And instead of the economic cycle being managed by throwing people out of work, which is the current situation, it's managed by allowing people to move during a recession into job guarantee. And during a, a boom situation, many people in the job guarantee will move into the market economy. I think Bill Mitchell makes that point very well. And it just seems so sensible. And a vital part of the thrust of our book, which is really to bring together economics, social change, environmental protection, social 
inequality issues. It's just the ideal combination. And I would have to add that because we feel that we cannot continue with growth in consumption, at least in the rich countries, and because clearly the lower income countries will still need to grow. For us, an unavoidable conclusion is that the rich countries are actually going to have to transition to a steady state economy, which is really one of the fundamentals of ecological economics. And probably they are going to have to undergo some planned degrowth. But planned degrowth is not the same as recession. If it's well planned, there is now growing evidence, including several computer models from different countries, from Canada, France, and Australia, that suggests that, yes, of course, if you just simply stop all growth without doing anything else, people will be thrown out of work and there will be a recession. But if you combine that with a range of other policies and a very important policy is the job guarantee, then these studies suggest that, in fact, you can get great reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, and still employ everyone. And that's very exciting. And I think as more and more of these studies are published, we can gain in confidence that a steady state economy is possible. I should emphasize what I mean by steady state economy. I'm using Herman Daly's definition, and that's a physical definition. So it means that there is no growth in the use of energy, materials, and land, and ultimately no growth in population. So it's at present, of course, the physical economy is tightly coupled to the monetary economy. And so a steady state economy would also involve or lead to a steady state in GDP, for example. But we're not terribly interested in GDP. We're interested in ecological, sustainable society, and social justice. And I guess a decent prosperity for everyone. So the job guarantee is part of that decent prosperity, but the other part has been discussed extensively by Jason Hickel, and that is your universal basic services. So, And what we mean by that is a society that provides an expansion of public health, public education, public transport, better support for the aged, for childcare, and so on. And we don't necessarily suggest that we're throwing out the market economy. The market economy, as we see it, would still exist, but it would have to be constrained to satisfy the requirements of ecological sustainability and social justice. So that's really the vision that we're developing in our book, The Path to a Sustainable Civilization, that we want to bring together ecological sustainability and social justice, and also, although we haven't discussed that so much, a more peaceful society as well. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener, and we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. People get very hung up on 
the term degrowth and like you led off by saying degrowth doesn't mean recession <laughs> and you've just gone on to outline all the policies that are included within degrowth including universal basic services so there's actually a lot of growth in things that people would really want in their society and obviously without the tension without the economic tension the social peace and justice that you just alluded to becomes much more possible, I think. Imagine your community without the threat of unemployment, without the threat of not being able to earn the means to put a roof over your head. I think uh, there's some very powerful stuff there. Yes, and in fact, with some audiences less sophisticated than the present audience, I wouldn't feel the need to mention the word degrowth, but rather talk about the kinds of society, the kinds of strategies, the kinds of policies that people would experience and that through job guarantee and universal basic services, a new set of indicators of well-being, then we would have a better society. And that's really what we're talking about. We're not terribly interested in what happens to GDP. It's a very limited indicator. Absolutely. And when you look at, say, wealth inequality, you realize that it's a very small fraction of humanity that actually owns financial wealth, even if wealth inequality is improving over time, over the very long term, over like 100 years or something. And the only wealth that most people in the UK will hope to hold, and I think this is going to be true in Australia and, and the USA and pretty much everywhere in the world, the only form of wealth that we will be able to hold is public wealth. And all of these things that you describe, universal basic services and uh, the right to always earn a socially inclusive wage with socially inclusive conditions, this all adds to public wealth, which is, I think, the surest route to fighting wealth inequality which again brings us a bit closer to that peace and justice situation that we want. And we're already seeing what we could call the first small step towards a different economic system. In some countries, we are now seeing some talk about well-being indicators and about the well-being economy. And I think that is a, an important step if it succeeds in providing additional indicators additional taking us well beyond GDP of the well-being of people in society. Yes. And the problem with GDP is if you invent a statistic, I'm not saying it's a fictitious statistic, it's possible to count in normal terms how many pounds or dollars worth of production was sold within a year. It could be a useful thing to know. But if you say, okay, that's the target rather than eradicate poverty, for instance, which is completely possible in the advanced economies. But if you make something like GDP growth a target, then that's what will happen. Overemphasizing the importance of GDP is a real problem. And on that topic, there are people who advocate green growth, this thing called green growth, that we can grow our way out of this problem. Would you be okay to talk about that, the problems with that? Well, the main problem is that even green technologies and green industrial activities will have some impact. They will require some materials. They will require some energy. So even though they will be preferable to brown or black economic activities, it's really impossible to decouple increasing economic activity from environmental impacts completely in an absolute sense. We can get some relative improvements, but I mean, even transforming the whole energy system to renewable energy, and I've been working in that field for 40 years, and I'm a strong supporter of renewable energy, but even though a renewable energy system will have very low direct environmental impacts, it will still, if it's growing, it will still turn the wheels of industry faster and faster and the wheels of transport faster and faster. And so an economy based on a growing renewable energy system will still come up against limits. It will just get there more slowly, fortunately, give us a bit more time. So that's another reason for arguing that we really need to talk about 
transitioning to a steady state economy for the rich countries and a system of economic exchange and assistance between the rich and the poor countries that enables the lower income countries to further grow both physically and economically. And that means, as I've said before, that the rich countries are going to have to reduce their use of energy and materials and land. Now, fortunately, in transitioning to renewable energy, there are some very big, almost automatic gains in efficiency, in energy efficiency. For example, transitioning from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles gives huge gains in efficiency. A petrol-driven car might have an efficiency of energy conversion of, say, 20%, which means that only 20% of the energy in the petrol actually goes into moving the car, and the rest is lost as waste heat. An electric car, on the other hand, would take 85% of the energy stored in its battery into motion of the vehicle, of the car. So that's transportation. Now, if you look at heating, combustion heating, again, is very inefficient. And if we replace burning fossil fuels to heat a home, say burning what used to be called natural gas, but should really be called fossil gas for home heating, then we can beat that many times over by using electric heat pumps, provided that electricity comes from renewables. Because an electric heat pump can produce four times, sometimes five times, the heat energy compared with the electrical energy input. Now, this isn't a violation of the law of conservation of energy because the energy input is not converted to energy output. The energy input is a way of pumping, if you're heating your house, pumping low temperature heat from outside into the house. It's the same in a refrigerator where it pumps heat out of the refrigerator. And its efficiency can be a factor of three, four, or five, meaning you get three or four or five times the benefit compared with the energy input. So there are some huge gains, and it means that a transition to renewable energy and energy efficiency could actually reduce the demand for energy in the whole world. Now, I believe that's necessary, and in fact, we may have to go a lot further than that, but it, it will be a good first step. But the trouble is, those efficiency gains are likely to be hidden if consumption keeps growing at a rapid rate. Yeah, it rhymes with the idea of the athlete running towards the finish tape and the, the stewards running away with the finish tape. <laughs> And as you were saying that, I couldn't help think there's a meme on the internet, big picture of the sun. And you can correct me if I'm probably going to say this wrong, but the caption is, if God had wanted us to have free energy, he would have put a giant fission reactor in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, okay. The spirit is right. It's actually a fusion reactor. Few, I, I knew I would say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry. The principle is right. We've got that fusion reactor, and we now have the cheapest forms of electricity coming directly from the sun in the form of solar photovoltaic power and wind power, which is basically the result of sunshine heating the earth unevenly and thus producing most of our winds. So solar energy, wind energy coming from the sun, they are in many parts of the world replacing fossil fuels already, at least for electricity generation. But we have a long way to go still in transportation and combustion heating because we need to not only convert electricity to renewables, but we need to electrify heating and transportation. Just before we come on to state capture and your recommendations to combat it, because we've brought this up, in terms of our adversaries on our ship heading towards the iceberg, you talk about renewable energy deniers, and in the book you break them down into three categories. Oh, gosh, look, I think I have to deal with this concisely because okay. it's almost a whole book to talk about the renewable energy deniers. But let me give you an example of the misleading stuff that is churned out 
by vested interests, usually ultimately coming from either the fossil fuel industry or the nuclear industry, which is very threatened by renewables. One example of a myth that is widely circulated is that renewable energy occupies vast areas of land and therefore it'll compete with agriculture and be a disaster and so on. Well, we have to look separately at wind power and solar power. And the truth is that with wind power, while wind turbines are widely spaced, and so they actually span quite large areas of land, usually agricultural land, they occupy very little land. And so agriculture continues between the wind turbines. The only land occupied is the actual turbine towers, access roads, and perhaps the substation. So wind power actually occupies very little land, and a open-cut coal mine would generally, in many cases, occupy more land than an equivalent set of wind farms. I'm assuming the open-cut coal mine is feeding into a coal-fired power station. Now, with solar... With large-scale solar, it's true that at present it does occupy significant land, but we could still power the whole planet with a remarkably small land area. But what's beginning to happen now with solar farms is that in many places they're starting to put them a bit higher off the ground so that sheep can graze underneath. And in China, we're already seeing some solar farms that are placed even higher so that crops can be grown and harvested underneath the solar farms. Yeah, it seems the critics may have forgotten about this third dimension. <laughs> yes, third dimension. And this is known as agrivoltaics in the case of solar. And although it costs a bit more to raise the solar collectors, it often pays for itself many times over by giving a second crop for the farmer, the crop of solar energy as well as sheep or wheat or whatever. And then, of course, in many regions, most of this or much of the solar power comes off rooftops. And that's certainly the case in my country. It's a very large percentage of all solar power, and that occupies no land. So the land issue is a furphy. It's definitely not a genuine issue. Now, there are many other issues like this that can easily be shot down and have been shot down many times, but just like the climate science deniers, the renewable energy deniers keep repeating the old stuff, keep trying to slow down, hold up the transition, the inevitable transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Yeah, I mean, there's a clue in the word non-renewable energy, isn't there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that it's on the way out, perhaps. <laughs> Well, it is on the way out, but not in all parts of the world yet. And the trouble is the fossil fuel industry wants to have a last gas, a last dash to sell as much fossil fuel as they can before their industry is really dead. Well, that gives us an opportunity to turn the corner into state capture. Well, yes, look, state capture, of course, the fossil fuel industry is a prime example of an industry that has captured nation states. And by state capture, I don't mean just ordinary old corruption, but rather capture of the government, the opposition, if there is an opposition, the public service, sometimes many other institutions within the country, totally captured. And of course, and the fossil fuel industry in countries that have a lot of fossil fuels, like the United States or Australia, or even China, the industry is incredibly powerful politically. And in my country, we actually had a, an infamous scene under the previous government where a lump of coal was brought into Parliament House and held up with glee, in fact, by one of the men who actually became Australia's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. And it was almost like a religious ceremony, a worship of a lump of coal, now, this lump of coal was provided by one of the main fossil fuel lobbies in Australia, the Australian Minerals Council. And what they did before giving it to the politicians is that they lacquered it so that the politicians wouldn't get their hands dirty. And I think that metaphor is... That is perfect. It is perfect metaphor. 
So fossil fuel industry is still very powerful and the tools, not just for fossil fuels, but for state capture in general, they involve political donations, election expenditure, what we call revolving door jobs, so that under the previous government in my country, the chief political advisor, the chief of staff for the prime minister was formerly the deputy director of the Minerals Council of Australia. And for both our major political parties, the coalition, the conservative coalition and the slightly less conservative Labor Party when it was in government, the minister for resources or energy when they retired in both parties were immediately given very highly paid jobs in the fossil fuel industry. So that's what I mean by revolving door jobs. The door turns in both directions. It brings people in from the industry into government, into advising government, and it takes retiring ministers into positions, very highly paid positions within the industries, the vested interests. Now, that applies to a whole range of industry areas, not just fossil fuels. More state capture comes from concentrated media ownership. And of course, the Murdoch press is infamous in the UK, in the United States, and in Australia. It's been so opposed to climate action that one of the Murdoch sons, who was part of that industry, James Murdoch, actually spoke up publicly and criticised the newspapers of News Corp for its bias on climate science. And he has left the family dynasty as a result. So concentrated media ownership is another. Now, all these situations, concentrated media ownership, political donations, election expenditure, and there are a number of other tools that are used by powerful industries to capture uh, nation states, they all can be weakened by tackling those tools. And in fact, in some countries at some times, they have been weakened, but often they recover and they fight back and gain further capture. Let me use another example. And again, forgive me for using Australian examples, but they really are of international significance. So in Australia, recently, the Australian government had previously agreed to buy submarines from France, which were diesel-powered. And diesel-powered submarines are actually the most suitable for patrolling the coastline, the boundaries. Uh, suddenly, there was a change. The government cancelled the French submarines and said rather it would form alliance with the UK and the United States and buy American and or British nuclear-powered submarines. Now, nuclear-powered submarines are less suitable for defending our coastline because they're noisy, but they are highly suitable for taking part in an attempted blockade of China in the South China Sea by the United States. And now it has been revealed that before that decision was made, the Australian Department of Defence employed five US retired admirals to advise it. Now, if that isn't state capture, what is? Uh, we've also got the same revolving door problem, and I won't go into the details. And also, we have a main advisor to the Australian government, which is often interviewed on the media as an objective organisation on foreign affairs and defence, is the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Now, this institute is funded jointly by the US and Australian governments and by the weapons industry. Yes, yes. That's half the problem, isn't it? That, you know, it's not so much bias as a problem in the media, it's undisclosed bias. On the caption underneath the person's uh, talking head, you won't see the list of vested interests that are funding their research and have done for years. You'll just see this very sober sounding title of their think tank. Yes. And again, I would argue that conventional economics has captured most governments, most countries, most nation states with its ideology, because I can't call it a science. And it is very difficult for independent commentators to actually get 
coverage on the media, someone like Bill Mitchell, for example, or one of the other proponents of modern monetary theory, for example. It is extremely difficult, but it is becoming slightly more possible now. So that we have seen an article in Modern Monetary Theory published in our conversation, The Conversation, which now is a major publication by authored by academics working together with editors. And that's a start. And we shouldn't forget that there's been huge leaps forward because the pandemic spending proved a lot of things about modern money theory, about where money comes from, what the limits to money creation are. And so people are looking at people like Stephanie Kelton now and as somebody with a more realistic view of how these operations work. And I think once you read the deficit myth and you get more interested in it, then you find out, again, you go to the source of the river. You've got Warren Mosler, Bill Mitchell, L. Randall Ray. These are all roots into people understanding the monetary system in a way that's going to help them further their aspirations, their democratic aspirations. And just on the topic of state capture, you did mention just a moment ago that it had been weakened in other times and places. And I know that we've been talking for a long time, but I just wondered whether you could, in the interests of demonstrating that it can be done, I just wondered if you could cite some of those examples. Okay. Well, concentrated media ownership has been controlled in a number of countries, including my own, in the past. But that was all watered down. And now it's possible for one corporation to have almost complete control over the print radio and television media in a major city. It has been controlled in the past. It's up to the community to push for controls again in the future. Political donations and election expenditure, they too have been partially controlled and managed in some places, even in some states of the United States. And right now, we're seeing a very interesting move in Australia to control election expenditure because one billionaire attempted to influence a federal election by putting in huge quantities of money into the election. And so the federal government has initiated some legislation that has not yet come before the parliament. But they have designed it in such a way, from what we have heard, that the legislation will try and disadvantage the new Greens or independents. At our last federal election, many independents were elected for the first time in a bunch on the policies that we need more climate action, amongst other things, as well as more transparency in government. And clearly the federal government and the federal opposition want to limit that so From what we've heard about the draft legislation, it will give election expenditure to existing members of parliament, but not to potential new members of parliament. And so to try and maintain the two-party system. Now, unfortunately, the two-party system will not produce adequate action on climate change. The two-party system will give tax deductions to the rich It will not produce adequate housing policy and so on. But nevertheless, revolving door jobs have also been managed in the past. And again, those restrictions have been weakened. And now there are strong moves from within the parliament, particularly from the Greens and independents, to require that a retiring minister cannot take up an appointment in an industry in which he was previously responsible for overseeing for at least three years, which would be a step forward if that manages to get through. So I guess my point is that all these tools of state capture can be tackled, but they need a strong public pressure. And one of the main themes of our book is that In the environmental movement, the social justice movement, the trade union movement, the peace movement, must form alliances in order to put very strong pressure on governments 
to weaken state capture and to weaken the power of conventional economics. And some of us are, are trying to work towards that, but it's a difficult process because the propaganda for the status quo has been very strong. And, of course, we are working against the concentrated media ownership that we face in our country and in many other countries. Well, we can only continue that work. And thank you for your time on this and, and the book. And before we wrap up, just to circle back to the hikers on the path to sustainability, for anybody that wants to get involved in the movement and make these connections and strengthen it, do you have any recommendations for what they should check out next, online, offline, events, publications, anything? Well, I think the first thing, really, if people are concerned, and I hope many of our listeners are concerned, is to join a group. And I think that's really important because as an individual, we are very powerless. But as a member of a group, we can actually move change. And so there are many groups, whether you join a climate action group or a heterodox economics group, Join a group of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Join a, a degrowth group. It's very rewarding to be interacting with, working with equally concerned people and learning from them and perhaps contributing to the learning of the whole group. So I'd say number one is to join a group and push for change. And there are many groups. There are groups of religious response to climate change. There are trade union groups, there are professional organizations, and there are community environmental groups and so on. So I think that's very important. In terms of readings, well, once you've finished our book, The Path to a Sustainable Civilization, I would strongly recommend the writings of Jason Hickel. He produced an excellent book called Less is More a few years ago. One of his colleagues is Georgios Callas, and his writing is very worth reading, both in books and in scholarly papers. If you read scholarly papers, well, of course, Modern Monetary Theory, uh, Stephanie Kelton's book is very readable and highly recommended. If you don't feel that you want to read a very technical textbook like the Mitchell, Ray and Watts book, and increasingly there are videos and other popular articles that are very valuable. I think. In terms of, because I am very concerned about the risk of war and in particular nuclear war, I think it's well worth checking out the writings and videos of interviews of Noam Chomsky in the United States, who well into his 90s is still a fount of wisdom. There is a growth of organizations now, starting from a small base, that are trying to bring together different types of organizations, social justice, environmental, democracy, and so on. And there is one group that was originally based in France called ATAC, which initially focused on pushing for a Tobin tax, a tax on financial transactions, but in fact is much broader than that now. So ATAC, I think it's A-T-T-A-C. There's a World Social Forum, and there are probably equivalents in the UK and the USA of an Australian group called the Australian Democracy Network, which again, because really what we're talking about partly is to enhance democracy, to take the power away from economists from vested interests, corporations and others that have captured the state, and to transform our societies to more genuinely democratic societies. I mean, for example, in the UK and in Australia, the whole country can be taken to war by the Prime Minister without any discussion in Parliament. That's both in the British system in the UK and the, the British system that we inherited in Australia. And it's absolutely the first thing they do when they're desperate politically as well. Exactly. Look for some small nation to push around. Exactly. And we can think of an example that the UK 
was involved in not so many years ago under Thatcher, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, and obviously that was pretty much what was behind the Iraq invasion in 2003 as well. Well, uh, the Iraq invasion was quite extraordinary. And also it demonstrated how weak democracy is in the United States and in the countries that followed the United States because there was never any evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And it was totally destructive. Many hundreds of thousands of innocent people were killed. For what? For nothing. The majority of the public, in, certainly in Australia, was totally impo- opposed to becoming involved in that war. And nevertheless, the government went ahead. The prime minister went ahead, basically, without any serious debate. And again, it demonstrates the need to strengthen democracy. And that, in this case, it means taking away the power of a prime minister or cabinet to take a country to war in a foreign country. Organized community can change. I mean, it can be slow, but we've seen that with the defeat of government support for slavery. We've seen it with civil rights for black Americans. We've seen it for votes for women in most parts of the world, but unfortunately not all parts of the world. We've seen it with the nonviolent removal of dictators in the Philippines, in Argentina, and in Serbia. So it can be done. There is hope, but it does require people to be organized, to become organized, and to be very determined. Yeah, it takes a lot of organized people to be a little bit of organized money. <laughs> That's right. Great stuff. That's a great place to leave it. I've been talking to Professor Mark Diesendorf about his latest book, co-authored with Rod Taylor, called The Path to a Sustainable Civilization, Technological, Socioeconomic and Political Change. And we'll link to where you can get hold of that in the show notes for this episode. And I'll also link to where you can find out more about the 2024 Scottonomics Festival, which takes place on the 22nd to the 24th of March in Dundee, Scotland. No matter where you are in the world, you can attend the sessions in real time because they'll be streamed live. Speakers include the mighty Steve Keen, who we brought up earlier, Dirk Entz and Pettifer, Daniela Gabor, Clara Mate, and BBC economics correspondent Andy Verity. If you want to take your understanding of MMT and heterodox economics to the next level, Modern Money Lab is running online graduate and postgraduate courses taught by the cream of MMT lecturers. I'm a student myself and I'm really enjoying it and I'm learning lots and maybe I'll see you in class. There's a link to more about that, more about Modern Money Lab in the show notes. And finally, for our Patreon subscribers, there's a link to all our patron-only episodes, including edited audio highlights of the book launch of MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers. There's also a bit of light entertainment from me. And there's an episode with Dr. Sam Levy about economics in the movies. Check out the show notes for all of the above. But for now, thank you so much for joining me today on the MMT Podcast, Professor Mark Diesendorf. Thank you very much, Christian. It's been a real pleasure. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget... You can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.